before I even start preaching. I feel good tonight. How many glad to be in the house of God? And you can be seated tonight in Jesus' name. I really do. I know I say it every time. I feel good tonight. God's been good to me. I, I can't speak for everybody in the building, but God has been good to me. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful to be here. Um, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time um, on preliminaries. I will ask the first thing this morning. We asked anybody that wanted a hard copy to our new church directory, and we ran out. So who didn't get one this morning that wants a hard copy to the church directory? Put your hand up nice and high. You're probably going to be more than I got here, so make sure I can make more. Just hand them to whoever they got their hands up, and we'll make more of them. Amen. Anybody else that wants one that doesn't get one, just give me a head count when you're done, Trevor. For anybody that doesn't get one, I just have to make some more on the copy machine in the office. Thank you to everyone that's here tonight. Thank you to everyone that's watching on Facebook Live. Um, I do want to say just one thing um, about our Facebook Live broadcast that we've been doing that we're going to continue to do. Um, I'll, Brother David, I'll get you one, okay? I promise. I'll make sure I make you one. Um, I, I just want to make everybody aware that the Facebook Live videos that we're doing are reaching people. I don't have any other way to say it than that. I know that there's a lot of people from the church that still aren't, aren't attending live here with us, and I'm glad that all those people, and if I start naming everybody by name, I'll forget somebody and somebody will get upset, but all the members of the church that are still able to watch, I'm, I'm thankful for that. But Believe, Pastor, when I tell you there are people that are being reached through this. Um, I get messages on Facebook, on Messenger all the time from people that are not regular members of this church that are watching our Facebook Live videos and that are being blessed, that are being touched, that are being ministered to. So um, I just want to let you know that it, it, is, it is touching hearts and reaching people. If you've got any friends on Facebook that are not on our church Facebook page, you ought to connect them to our church Facebook page because I, I do believe that God works. I know the Bible says in mysterious ways, technology is not mysterious anymore. It's something that everybody has um, access to for the most part, and I'm glad that we're able to, to use this avenue to reach people. So thank you to anyone that's watching on Facebook Live. I hope you get something out of the message tonight. I hope I can preach this how I feel it, because I feel really good tonight. God, I, God is good. In a, in a world that right now, you can't turn your TV on without seeing something negative, something heartbreaking, something uh, that, that, that bewilders you, something that dumbfounds you, maybe something that angers you. Um, I, I noticed I got a, a, an alert on my on my phone right before I came out of the office that I don't know what it is, but somebody asked us to pray for the first responders that I guess they're doing something in Youngstown right now that's probably not real good. Um, and you know what? I, I, as much as I know that that's the, the, the temperature of the hour, God is good. Yes, yes. I can't say it any other way. I can say that the God that I serve is good. Now, he's not just good, he's great. And he's great to be praised. So I hope tonight that we can just turn that off. It's not pretend like it doesn't exist. Not pretend like it's not going to be there when we go home. But can we just, for the next however long I talk, can we just forget all that and say we're in God's house and He's worthy of some praise and He's worthy to be magnified and He's worthy to be worshipped by just hope you can do that. Stand with me real quick. Don't forget Bible study Wednesday night. We'll continue um, talking about taking heed and we'll probably start in the book of Daniel. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll get to Revelations finally. I'm not sure. But there's just a whole bunch of stuff that I hope you're enjoying that. If you're not enjoying it, oh well. I'm enjoying studying it. I'm loving studying it. So Wednesday night we'll continue our Bible study. But tonight turn to the book of Jude. The book of Jude, and when you have that, you can say amen. Jude's way at the end. For anybody that doesn't know where Jude is, Jude only has one chapter, so we can't turn to Jude chapter 5, because there's only one. 
Jude, verse number 3. When you have that, say amen. amen. The Bible reads like this, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. The end of that verse says that we should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Another translation, and I just want to read it to you. It says, Dearly loved friends, I have been planning to write you some thoughts about the salvation God has given us, but now I find I must write of something else instead, urging you to stoutly defend the truth that God gave once for all to His people to keep without charge through the years. We are admonished to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Brother Matt, would you ask God's blessing on this message, please? Lord God, we come to you tonight once again. Thank you for another opportunity, Lord, to be in your house. I pray to be a pastor tonight as it brings forth your word. We pray the Holy Ghost, Lord, reach all those that need it, Lord. Be with our hearts, our souls, our minds tonight, Lord. We come to you, Lord, in your name, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you for standing tonight. You can be seated in Jesus' name. I'll give you my title in a moment. We live right now in a world of delivery service. Can anybody say amen to that? Amen. Even before COVID-19 came on the scene, we had a massive spike in delivery companies popping up everywhere. Now that we have experienced a viral pandemic, and people don't want to get out too much. Food delivery services are booming. Absolutely booming. If you don't know this, let me give you a few. How many have ever heard of Grubhub? A couple people. How about DoorDash? A couple more people. How about Uber Eats? And for those of you that haven't raised your hand at all, these are just a few companies that will deliver your favorite restaurant food right to your door. For a small fee, of course. It's not free. It's convenient and it's safe all at the same time. Every one of us loves convenience. So in a world that, and, and pardon the pun, is eating up on the newfound service of food delivery where it's not just pizza anymore. I was thinking recently on this thought. What exactly is the church delivering nowadays? Because believe it or not, the church is in a delivery service. We are delivering a product. Whether we realize it or not, you are delivering something to the world. Whether or not you want to admit it, you deliver something to the world. The Bible says it like this. Ye are our epistles, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. Whether you ever stand behind a podium and quote unquote deliver a message, you are a delivery person for something every single day of your life. So I'm asking you tonight, what exactly is the church delivering? What are you delivering? So I thought tonight that I would preach to you on this subject in a very timely title that I will put on it. And the title for tonight's message is this. Uber Eats Jesus Style. Because right. we're delivering something to somebody. Before I get too much into my notes, because I've got a few and I, 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 I don't want to just read them word for word. Do you realize that you are delivering something? Yes. 
Do you realize you are carrying a message? Every day of your life, wherever you go, if you work a job and you go to the job every day, whether or not you walk in there with the Bible tucked under your arm and you're saying, I'm going to come in here and proclaim the name of Jesus and I'm going to go preach the gospel to everybody I work with, you may never say those words, but trust me when I tell you, you're delivering something. When you go to work, those people that you work with, that you tell them you're a Christian, that you tell them you're saved, that you tell them you have the Holy Ghost, that you tell them you live for God, guess what? They're watching you, and they have a right to watch you. The old saying that says actions speak louder than words may not be written in the Holy Scriptures, but nothing could be more true than the fact that your actions will speak louder than any words have that ever come out of your mouth. How people see you react to certain situations will mean more than any message that you could ever preach to them anyhow. They used to say it like this, I'd rather see a message than hear one anytime. So you are delivering something to someone. What exactly does the church deliver? The verse that we read in Jude tells us to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Something that we receive, what are we doing with it? I heard a preacher say it like this one time. If you've got Jesus in your heart, let him out. I like that. Now think about it. That doesn't mean forget about Jesus. That means if you've got him in there, let him out a little bit. Uh, I, 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 I don't want to preach current events. God knows. God knows I don't want to act like you just turned on you know, the, the news station tonight. But, but, but there's a lot of stuff going on in our world over the last three or four or five days, and I'm not here to add fuel to the fire. But I've heard every commentary and I've heard every explanation and say that uh, those people that are involved in what's taking place just got a lot of stuff inside of them. They just got a lot of frustration. They just got a lot of anger. They just, they've been hurt and they, and all these things. And, and so they're just expressing themselves. And I've got a very, 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 very strong opinion on that that I will keep to myself right now. If you want to know, ask me after church. But I got a very strong opinion on that that I'll keep to myself. But here's the thought that came to my mind last night. I was watching it on the news. I went up in the bedroom by myself because I knew the rest of the family didn't want to watch it. And I'm watching it and I'm thinking, they, they, they really are expressing themselves. Right, wrong, or indifferent. They're not afraid. Oh, man, I hope I can just pull it from the headlines for just a moment. They're not afraid to express their feelings. They're not afraid to let you know where they stand on the hot button issue right now. And where, I ask, where is the church at? What is it that we got inside of us that we're afraid to let out? I'm not talking about anger, and I'm not talking about riots, and I'm not talking about protests. I'm talking about the Holy Ghost. the goodness of God? Why don't we express the love of God? Why don't we just, just, like, just like the song that we just worshiped to? I love that song. I told you about who wrote that song if you've never heard about the person in the wheelchair that wrote that song that says, when I reach those pearly gates and they swing open wide, I'm going to leap for joy. The person can't leap for joy right now, but they know when they get to glory, they're going to leap for joy. But that song says, uh, that song says that uh, if you think I'm going to shout in heaven, just look at what I'm doing right now. What kind of message are we sending to a lost and dying world? What are we delivering to our unsaved friends and our unsaved loved ones and those that we work with and our neighbors and the people that are watching us? Are we delivering them a message of hope? Are we letting them know that this God that we serve is still in control? Are we letting them know that this God that we pray to and preach about and sing about is still all powerful? Are we letting them know that despite what they see on the news, Jesus Christ is still God and he's still in control and he's still worthy to pray and worship and to be magnified? How are we to live? Our world has changed. America 
has changed. Whether you get your news from the television or online, the information is the same. The United States is no longer the country she once was. Before you call me Benedict Arnold, I'm the most patriotic man you'll ever meet in your life. America has the largest number of Christian churches, colleges, seminaries, resources, and media of any nation in the world. Yet our values and predominant worldview demonstrate that America is becoming less and less Christian yes. every single day. Yes. The elimination of prayer and the Bible from state schools was only the beginning. Right. Now Christians themselves are being targeted for the free exercise of their faith in their public eye. The Ten Commandments and crosses have been systematically and progressively removed from public places. Christian influence is slowly being purged from the American conscience. Christians are no longer having an impact on culture and those in it, choosing instead to remain, help us God, content and safe within their own churches and Christian circles. We are not imparting the gospel in a way that the next generation can grasp. I'll say amen to myself. Of course, the message of the gospel has not changed. I can't emphasize that enough. The message of the gospel has not changed, but the way people think has changed dramatically. It's simply not like it was years ago when people stood up and people sat down and listen to the gospel and respond. Evangelism in our culture today seems difficult and sometimes almost impossible. We preach Jesus, people just don't seem to care. Anybody experience that? I sure have. Sad to say, but most people no longer have the foundational information about God, His Word, or their need for Him. Right. To say that times have changed would be a vast understatement. And sad to say this, but some in the church have changed right along with them. Yes. Hmm. I hope I can get some old-time Christians, Holy Ghost-filled apostolic folk to get with me for just a moment before you get upset. Here's what I remember. I ain't as old as some of y'all, but I'm getting there. Had a conversation with my kids just yesterday. My daughter said, it, well, no, it, it wasn't my daughter. I take that back. It was Allie Dean. It was Aaron's girlfriend. We were out at the store. And she brought me up this, this mug, this cup, and she said, I'm going to buy you this for your birthday. And said something about old man on it. And I'm, I'm just starting to just you know, like accept it a little bit. And she looked at me and she said, it said 50 on it? Yeah, 50 on it. Yeah, Austin remembers. He was in on it. it. It said 50 on it. She said, just how old are you, Brother Darrell? And I said, well, I'm 47, soon to turn 48. And Aaron looked at me and said, man, Dad, you're almost 50. <laughs> and then he said, that means you're halfway to 100. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I am. But all that means I've been around for a little bit, so some of the rest of y'all have been around just a little bit longer than I have. And if your memory is still there, don't tell on yourself if it's not, but if your memory is still there, Brother Darrell can remember that I grew up in a church where the fire of God was the normal and not the exception. Ain't enough people in here clapping right now. church. Don't be offended right now, but I remember being in a church where we didn't have to get there and pray the fire down because the fire was already there when you walked in. Don't get mad. I'm just wondering what we're delivering. I'm guilty of this sometimes. So 
So confession's good for the soul. If this makes you think less of me, you didn't really think much of me to begin with. But I'm honest enough to admit that sometimes we come to church and we're just going to walk in the door and we're going to flip some Holy Ghost switch. It's quiet in here now. We just come to church and, that, and the church is like the phone booth for Superman. That we're just going to walk in the door. And as soon as we walk through those, we've walked into the Holy of Holies. And God is suddenly going to come down and touch everybody. Ain't thought about God since you walked out of the church the last time. Ain't read his word. You ain't fasted. You ain't prayed. You've watched TV all day. You've had your mind on secular things. You haven't done one spiritual thing since you walked out of the building. But you're going to walk in and suddenly the Shekinah glory is going to show up. I remember a time when people prayed all day. When they walked in the building, they already had the Spirit. Oh my. I know I'm going to show my age just a little bit. I remember a time when the preacher would say, come to church early. And don't come to exchange recipes. Oh, Brother Barry going to make everyone mad. What are we delivering? I remember when you come to church early, you went back in a prayer room, or you came to an altar. You Remember this morning when we were like on the verge of everyone shouting on Pentecost Sunday, and we talked about the atmosphere changing? You remember a time when the people in the church actually created an atmosphere for the presence of God to move before they hit the first note on the keyboard, before they strung the first string on that old-fashioned guitar. There had been some men and women of God that had said, God, would you move amongst your people tonight? Would you show your spirit amongst the church tonight? Would you let go? What, what are we delivering? Because the church always had the fire. The fire in the Bible represented the presence and the acceptance of God. And here's one of my favorite verses about the fire. There's all kinds of them in the Bible. Can't read them all tonight. But Leviticus 6 and 13 says, The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. Never go out. We as the church can never let the enemy extinguish our fire. We must never allow our flame to die. We must never get to the point in our spiritual lives when we begin to accept anything less than the fervent and persistent power of the Holy Ghost fire that burns in your heart and your soul. You should never be satisfied with living in the smoke, living in the dying embers of yesterday's fire, living on the war, and we should be fighting in the heat. Matthew 3 and 11, the Bible says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. The Holy Ghost is a fire that we should all possess. Hebrews 12 and 29 says, Our God is a consuming fire. Thought about that word consuming. We all know the initial encounter that we have with that fire when it consumes our souls. And it burns out all the evil, ungodly, unholy sin from our lives. It's an amazing experience. It's undeniable. It's an example of the consuming power that the Holy Ghost fire has. We know we were bound, and when the fire fell, it burned that out. We know we were addicted, and when the fire fell, it took that away. We know we had vices, and we had things that we couldn't get rid of on our own. And when the Holy Ghost fell, the fire burned out. But here's what happens. Please say amen if this is you. All too often we have a spiritual letdown. We face some spiritual opposition. Amen. We experience some spiritual problems. Yes. And hell seems to be giving us fits. Amen. And we suddenly forget about the fire. 
We forget about the power that comes along with it. We forget that it has the ability to consume. And that consuming isn't just sin. The consuming is not just for sin. The Bible says that, the, that the, the power of God, the love of God, the blood of God, that it'll cover anything. A multitude of sins, it says. But we need to go beyond that and realize that the consuming fire of God can still consume things in our life that might not necessarily be sin. If you keep the Holy Ghost hot, the fear stays away. If you keep the Holy Ghost hot, the doubt stays away. If you keep the Holy Ghost hot, the worry stays away. So what happens? The church lets down just a little. Doesn't mean we backslide. Doesn't mean we're going to hell. It does mean what are we delivering? I had a person tell me one time, and it really, it didn't make me angry, Brother Clester. It made me think. I had a person tell me something one time, maybe not word for word, but this is kind of the, 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 the crust of what he said. The church has become irrelevant. And as much as that sounded like a satanic thing to say and a blasphemous thing to say, it made me think for a minute. What are we delivering? What does the world ex what does the world expect from the church? Because there was a time when they expected a lot from the church. There was a time when people turned to the church in times of need, in times of turmoil, in times of trouble. Oh, man. Let me tell you how this, this, is just, this ain't going back too far. This is me in high school. I had some buddies that, for lack of a, a, a better way to describe them, they were kind of troublemakers. They were kind of hellions. And they weren't Christians, quote unquote. And they liked to do some things that were not uh, uh, godly, that ungodly, um, destructive at some points. They would do some things that their mamas wouldn't want to know right now that they did. But they would always say this to me, Clyde, we know your dad's a preacher. We just want you to know we don't ever do nothing anywhere around churches. If we're around the church, we go the opposite direction. We don't want to be anywhere near a church when we're doing fill in the blank. When we're doing whatever it was they were going to do that weekend. They just wanted me to know that at some point, something had been instilled in them. There was something about the church being relevant. There was something about they knew. I told you stories about men I used to work with in the mill, Brother Richard. They didn't want anybody else to know because they had a reputation to uphold. They didn't want anybody else to know because it thought, they thought it might make them look weak. But they would come to me personally and they would say, Hey, I know you're a man of God. I know you pray. If you tell anybody else I told you this, I'll deny it. I'll call you a liar to your face. But would you pray for this? My wife's going through this. My kids are dealing with this. I got a daughter that's doing this. I got a son that I can't handle. Would you please pray for that? There was a time when they knew the church had what they said they had. They might not have wanted to be a part of it, but they knew the church had power. What is the church delivering right now? Do they still look at the church? For that? Do they still experience the consuming fire of God when they come to a church? Or have they become what happened in the book of Exodus? Now I won't read all the scriptures, but the book of Exodus talks about that there was a Pharaoh that arose up in Egypt and it said he didn't know Joseph. And then it goes on further and it says that there was a generation that came after that that it says that they didn't know God or His acts. Huh. I want to read that one. It's in the book of Judges. I didn't give it to Sister Natalie, so don't blame her when it's not on the screen. Judges chapter 2, verse number 7. The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua. 
and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. They buried him in the border of the inheritance in Timnath Heres in the Mount of Ephraim on the north side of the hill Gaash. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. And there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. Mm, man, does that scripture really, really resonate with me. A generation arose that knew not God, and they didn't know his works. I've said this before in this church, and I feel led of the Holy Ghost to say it again. I pray to God that I don't and that we don't as a generation become simply a generation of storytellers. Hmm. This scripture of Judges said there was a generation that came up that they didn't know God and they didn't know His works, Brother Chris. What are we delivering right now? What is the world getting from us? Is the world getting a whole bunch of good stories? Is the world getting a whole bunch of what I like to call used to goods? Used to goods are that story that can you do that anymore? No, but I sure used to could. Does that ever happen anymore? Oh, Brother Daryl, I remember a day. I remember a time. What are we delivering today? I remember when this happened. You have a generation arose in the Bible times that the first verse says they didn't know Joseph, and then not too long after that, they didn't know God either. A whole generation that did not know God and did not know His works. And if that happens in 2020, shame on the church. Amen. That simply cannot happen again. Amen. This generation that we live in right now should know two things. They should know you and they should know your God. Brother there, I don't want nobody to know me. I just want to live over in my own little corner. I just want to do my own little thing. The church should be relevant. You should have influence Amen. with people. The church should have influence. Right. We should be affecting our communities. Amen. We should be affecting our unsaved family Amen. and our unsaved friends yeah. and our unsaved loved ones to the point that they should want what you have. Amen. 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 Uber Eats. You don't call and order something you don't want. No. Right? Amen. You're not going to... I'll just use me personally. I ain't calling and order no broccoli. I don't want that. I don't want to call and order the, the vegetable of the day. I don't want that. I don't want to call and order something with cauliflower or some other type of food that they feed to a cow. When I call... I'm going to call and order something I want. Right? right? I'm going to call and order a steak. I want the biggest steak that they got. I want a baked potato loaded with cheese and sour cream and bacon bits. Anybody else hungry right now? You order what you want. And you expect to get what you order. Right. Have you ever been disappointed with an order yes. when you don't check it? Yeah. I can't raise my hand enough time to say you go through the drive-thru, you get home, and what you paid for ain't in the bag. Yeah. I've learned to check the bag before I pull away from the window. Right. Sometimes the guy behind me beeps his horn, and I just say, hold on a second, buddy, they forgot my Baconator. So i got to ask him to give it to me, because I want to make sure what I ordered is in the bag. We've got a world that is needy. We've got a world that needs what we have. Listen to me and listen to me good. They need what we have. They need God. They need to see the love of God. They need to feel the power of God. What are we delivering to them? Malik.
believe me when I tell you. Telling a story about how it used to be, it's not going to work. Amen. Amen. Telling a story about something that happened in 1978, that's not going to work. <laughs> Telling a story about how it was back in the day, that's not going to work. Amen. Showing a video of sermons gone by on Facebook or YouTube is not going to work. Saying these words, it ain't like it used to be, ain't going to work. See, here's where I kind of, I might get too close to that camera right now. Here's where I kind of have to divide and separate myself between how old some people think I am and how old I really am. I'm old enough to remember all those stories that people tell. I'm young enough to know that God's still the same right now. Amen. Yes. I know what it's like to say, oh, I remember that one service back at Hilltop. Or I remember that one time we did this. Or I remember that one time we did that. And that's great to have stories to reminisce on. That ain't saving nobody's kids. Amen. Oh, man. It's great to have a story about the person that got healed back in 1987 at some healing crusade you went to under some tent in Youngstown. But that ain't curing cancer in 20 old oh my. God. I have to preach what I feel. What is the church delivering right now? I'm thankful for what God did in yesteryear, but I need a generation to rise up.
there's a fee involved. So if you're one of those cheap folks that doesn't even tip the pizza delivery guy when he comes to your house, you probably don't want to call Uber Eats. Because it costs something. Why are you saying that, Brother Darrell? That's why the scripture tells us that we read at the beginning of this sermon. It tells us to earnestly contend yes, come on. for the faith that was once delivered Amen. to the saints. Amen. Earnestly contend hallelujah. means you have to be willing, oh, hold on, yes, on, to fight for it. Yes, come on. I told you I have a very strong opinion what's going on in our nation right now. I have a very strong opinion of some of the things I've seen in the news reports lately. But I will say one thing. There's some people right now in some towns across this nation, they don't care what you think. You hear me? They don't care what you think. They don't care if you think they're right or wrong. They're doing something that they're passionate about. They're doing something that they actually believe in, right, wrong, or indifferent. They're not doing it to seek your approval or your approval or my approval. And God help the church when we're seeking the approval of the world. I don't care what somebody else thinks about me. I am not ashamed. want the 
church to be relevant. I know there's people that cheer for you, maybe from the background. They want you to succeed. They really do. They want you to be prosperous. They want your God to be real. Do you know why they really want your God to be real? They might not come over and say, hey, let me hear that one song he was playing. Hey, can you give me a home Bible study? Hey, can you quote this verse to me? They might not say that, but Sister Marie, I promise you that there's people in Giant Eagle that want your God to be real. Why? Because there's going to come a day when they want you to deliver what you say you have to them. And they need your God to be real. So you can go ahead if you want. I'm getting ready to close. When my microphone's falling off, that means it's time to stop. You can go ahead if you want. Have your cute little church. If you want to. Go ahead and have your little regular church if you want to. Go ahead and have your little kickback, relaxed church if you want to. Go ahead and say that this stuff doesn't really matter. I got the Holy Ghost and I got my certificate to prove it. That's your attitude. Go right ahead. But I have a newfound emphasis, desire, fire burning in my life, Sister Constance. That I want to start delivering Jesus to me. Yes. Yes. Oh God, yes. <clears throat> See, because I know it's a convenience for some folks. I've heard my dad say many, 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 many times, you may be the only Bible somebody ever reads. I know our desire, my desire, your desire should all be the same. My desire is to get as many people to come to church as I can. I want this church to be full right now. I know that makes some people nervous, but right now, I want this church full. I want to have to knock the walls out tomorrow. That's my desire. That's my hope. That's my, my prayer to God. But in the process of time, while I'm waiting for someone to come, while I'm praying for someone to come, while I'm inviting someone to come, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to deliver Jesus to them right where they are. I'm going to let them see God in me wherever they see me at. I'm going to let them know that God is in control at home as much as he is.
The tearing part was my fault, not God's. When my heart was right, God came in. I can't say it any different than that. There were some stumbling blocks. There were some things that the enemy planted in my way. There were some things that I had to get through and buy it around. But when my heart was right, God came in. So I want to emphasize this. There is nothing stopping the church from experiencing a mighty move of God that happens right now. I've said this once, twice, maybe a dozen times. So I want to say it again and then I promise I'll close. My mind might be different than yours and that's okay. I don't always think straight. But my mind is like this. I don't care if somebody comes walking into the church and the last thing that they do before they open those doors is take the cigarette out of their mouth and put it out on the concrete right outside the door. Well, Brother Darrell, I wouldn't be too nice of them. I don't care if they walk in here with liquor on their breath. I don't care if they've done an ungodly act in their car right before they walk in. Thank you. 